Kentucky at HQ USACE, supporting the standards and criteria program. Brandon previously ran the mechanical design section at the Louisville District and acted as a sustainable design and development POC for many years. Brandon has been the lead for several of the former energy and sustainability centers of expertise. He's a past instructor of Prospect Course 244, Sustainable Military Building Design and Construction, and participated as a supporting member in many DASA IEE sustainability and lead validations. Uh, Brandon has led or coached teams through the energy optimization process on numerous projects and participated in developing related criteria for USACE. Brandon has performed similar roles for commissioning and mechanical design and has had, and has had technical and leadership positions at district, uh, MSC, and HQ levels in engineering, construction, project management, and AE management. He's a licensed professional engineer. He's a lead AP building design and construction, certified energy manager, and certified building commissioning professional. Brandon still commutes to the Louisville district office several times a week. And we also have Dan Edwards with us today. Dan Edwards currently serves as the lead mechanical engineer at the Philadelphia District of USACE. Daniel has been with the Philadelphia District for 20 years and has performed numerous energy models and life cycle cost analyses. Daniel has worked on several lead projects throughout the year in addition to a GBI guiding principles project. He has designed projects for the FAA, Air Force, Army, Army Reserves, US, uh, US Forces in Iraq, and Afghanistan and several core districts. He's had a project audited by ASA, IE and E, in the past, which has sensitized him to the high level attention that is given to this aspect of design and the extent of documentation expected. Daniel is an active participant in several USACE COPS and is almost always willing to, almost in Princess, you gotta love that, almost always willing to help a team member, not only in Philadelphia, but across the enterprise. Recently, he assisted HUU in developing a new version of ER 1110-1-8173, the Energy Modeling and Life Cycle Cost Analysis. He has also engaged the Department of Energy, HQU says Mobile and Savannah to ascertain how the adoption of ASHRAE 90.1 of 2019 impacts the DOD's ability to meet the latest updates to 10 CFR 433, especially in conjunction with building electrification. He's a licensed professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and is a qualified commissioning professional. He's married and has two children, ages three and six. So with that, I will stop jabbering and I will hand it over to Brandon Martin and Dan Edwards. Thank you so much, guys. Hi, Dan Edwards. Um, don't thank us yet because we haven't given the presentation. Um, let me uh, get my slides shared. Hey, Dan, wouldn't while, believe while you're how hard it is uh... to get people to uh, sign up for it. So thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, while, while you're getting the slides up, I just want to point out to everybody, this is a one hour uh, session. This is something that, as Ed has noted numerous times, could probably use a several day class. Um, so we're... We're really just going to do an awareness brief. Um, we're not going to dive deep, deep into details. Um, so just keep that in mind. We'll we'll definitely answer questions at the end, and and you can always call and ask us questions. Um, but um, this is a, a it's a, a big topic crammed into one hour. So uh, just have patience with us. Thanks. <clears throat> can everyone see my screen? I can't Brown. see it. Uh, oh, it might just be a lag on my. Stephanie, is it coming through for you? We're seeing a black stream with your cursor is all. Well, that's good news because that's the presentation. See, this is a black hole. No, all right, let me uh, reset, let me reshare. Never seems to work well when you try to share a particular window. How's about now? Got it. All right, excellent. I'll turn my video. I have my video off to save you all the uh, uh, seeing me, but also um, to save some bandwidth for y'all. <clears throat> 
So our agenda simply today, um, we're going to go over some references, the, the policy drivers and goals uh, of the energy modeling and life cycle cost analyses and how they are incorporated and spelled out in uh, what I'll refer to uh, from now on as just 8173 um, and the expectations and how the um, how it gets integrated with the design process. This slide that has lots of information on it is just for your reference and for your uh, reading pleasure when you want to learn the whys and wherefores of how all this stuff came to be. Uh, the very important ones are uh, in bold uh, as that relates to what we're doing here today. Uh, one important note is that 8173 is undergoing a major renovation. We're trying to keep it policy agnostic. Uh, so regardless of whatever comes out of uh, future Congress, or administrations that it will hopefully not be too greatly affected by that to where it will be obsolete once someone else uh, gets in, in power. Um, and so the the ER focuses on a what to do. Uh, it describes the process, the team members, what needs to be documented, how to do it, and provides some examples on that. Um, it's in review right now. Um, and has gone through uh, some publishing uh, rigmarole to get it uh, looking nice per G6's rules. Uh, so don't know when it's coming out finally, but that's the uh, that's the update on that. And this is this graphic kind of shows how all the how a couple slides ago these uh, references tie into our um, our standards and criteria. So we have um, we have these federal laws, these present we have various executive orders and then DOD and service agency policy that all feed into our 1-202 and our implementing guidance is through the Army Sustainability Implementation Guide and the 8173 and any follow on ECBs um, that have come that come from it or impact it. So our broad goals in performing this is we're trying to, we're attempting to conserve energy resources uh, and reduce our reliance upon those energy resources. Uh, this ties also into resilience, which is another buzzword uh, so that to maintain the habitability and operability of our installations and facilities during an emergency event. Uh, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and uh, we're trying to do this in a life cycle cost effective manner, which um, as shown here on the slide is uh, either the lowest total cost of ownership or the lower a lower total cost of ownership than a defined standard. More specifically, for the federal government, we are to reduce our energy usage to a fixed goal, 30% better, if it's life cycle cost effective compared to the standard, which the standard it, we'll talk about in a couple of bullet points. But uh, otherwise, the, the goal is to, to have the uh, least energy consuming building. Um, However, that is just a general federal requirement. A agency specific goals could be more stringent. Uh, so it's always good to find out from your uh, from whom with whom you're working as to what you need to do specifically. Um, we're also by statute and policy to uh, incorporate specific technologies if they're life cycle cost effective, such as solar hot water, renewable energy, alternative water. Uh, and as compared to not incorporating those options, I believe the statute is 30% solar hot water, if LCCE. Um, and as mentioned before, the uh, standard, uh, the standard that's been adopted for our commercial buildings is the um, ASHRAE standard 90.1. Uh, the current flavor is 2019. Uh, for residential, like say for military housing, the International Energy Conservation Code applies. 
and we're supposed to use Energy Star products, and where Energy Star products are not available, dump designated products, which is essentially the efficiency tables from the 90.1. Um, you know, Hot mic. Um, we're also supposed to incorporate uh, passive design, and that will also help achieve those energy goals uh, using natural infrastructure, or lower carbon materials to reduce emissions, uh, which will reduce our impact to electrical infrastructure to handle our electrification mandate. And last but not least, uh, when you exceed certain thresholds, you are you have to do a third party rating tool uh, for us Army folks that it is lead. So we have implementing guidance. The 1 202 um, is from Chai Services and describes what goals need to be met based on the applicability uh, and also describes the also states the applicability to which uh, the the UFC applies, gets into the documentation required, like for the energy uh, compliance analysis, and also gets into some methodology. It contrasted with ER 8173, it's a USACE business practice. Now, the, the version that's available right now is uh, essentially two older ECBs that were smashed together, and uh, we've been using that for years now. Um, and it includes expectations from team members. It also talks about documentation, process, quality control, et cetera, which the new one will as well. Doing this, why, why are we doing this? Now, it's all about energy optimization. So, you know, it, uh, and there's a lot that goes into it. So we are evaluating strategies to comply with federal DOD and service component energy requirements. Um, so it's not just a let's go get the best HVAC system we can or most energy efficient HVAC system. It's whole building, you know, the 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 buzzword of or buzzwords of integrated design. So this gets into, as you can see from the lower left hand portion of the graphic, you know, all orientation and massing, lighting, passive strategies, building envelopes, all feed into how the HVAC systems get designed and vice versa. Um, so it, everything, it's, we're trying to pick the best strategies as the upper graphic shows that we identify and verify our goals and constraints. We identify our baselines and progress on our way toward documentation after we select optimum systems and features. Um, so, you know, if we actually had a chance to coordinate with an installation as to like where a building can go on the site, we could advise them as to, hey, it'll work better if you change the aspect ratio of your building or, um, you know, uh, try use, using a natural shading or to, reduce the solar load on the building. So, uh, and it would be great if we could have that influence over um, the installations, but we usually get the building and the site uh, after that's already been decided. This I am not going over. This is just an optimization flow chart uh, for your reference. So you can see how complicated this, the uh, decision-making process can be. And here, what goes into an energy model? Well, on the left hand side, everything that you see, all the uh, hubs, you know, you got the hub and the spokes. So the building envelope, lighting, HVAC, service, water heating, energy storage, orientation and massing all feed into the energy model. And as an example of um, how gra a more granular example to show how everything can impacts one another, say your goal was to reduce your cooling energy, you can just see how it uh, branches out from there as to how many other components will affect that goal. Um, and 
we then use the information from the energy model to generate a table or a matrix of alternatives uh, in a life cycle cost analysis. And everything's done in first cost, uh, or rather present value uh, in constant dollars using the discount factors that are given uh, by statute, uh, depending on the analysis you're running. And, uh, you know, again, um, it's not just build a building and then see which HVAC system you can give it to make it better. Um, it, it, it's a concerted effort. So we're, we have to look at different wall types, uh, maybe different glazing, um, and then see if it's life cycle cost effective or not to implement that. So there are different optimization thresholds in the current 8173. Um, it's uh, when we have to do the optimization kicks in at 10,000 square feet and $3 million. And there's no difference between new construction or innovation in terms of the requirements for it. Uh, in the proposed in the revision or revised blah, 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 revised version of 8173, um, we're pegging the uh, applicability to the thresholds that are in the UFC 12002. So currently those thresholds are 10,000 square feet and in parentheses says it's going to go up to 25 KSF, thankfully, and $3 million. For a renovation it has to be 50%, I think it has to be 50% uh, or more than the estimated replacement cost and $3 million, et cetera. Um, Air Force, all construction. So who, who makes up the team? Well, there are a lot of us. So <clears throat> the project manager, um, you know, is, responsible for establishing the integrated team to incorporate the processes into the project schedule to the budget for this work, which can be quite intensive. Uh, and they are to keep P2 updated regarding the sustainability status. Um, the actual uh, crew that's going to do the work consists of the, the technical leader design manager, depending on uh, the lingo your district uses, the energy modeler, the designers, cost engineering, stakeholders, and subject matter experts. And each one has a uh, role to play. So the SMEs will prove and validate proposed alternatives so that you're not <clears throat> trying to game the system by coming up with something that you couldn't do anyway, like, you know, VRF systems. Oh, we're going to consider a VRF system. Guess what? You can't because you know, you can't use them uh, or you're not supposed to, or you have to ask super secret permission and all this other stuff. Um, as far as the uh, energy modeler, the energy modeler could be one of the designers or uh, it could be someone from a uh, AE firm or just someone, just another team member who happens to be good at plugging and chugging. Um, and cost engineering, Per their reg is supposed to perform the LCCA, but as I hear you all laughing, um, the uh, they will at least in our experience, we the guy who's doing the energy modeling is the one who's doing the LCCAs. However, it should be the individual disciplines or cost supporting those folks uh, when needed. Um, for example, for the architects, if you're evaluating different glazing types. Yeah, the energy mo the energy modeler will put that information into the energy model. However, it, he'll give you the information for you to put in your uh, your LCCA as opposed to everything going on the mechanical. Uh, so the tech lead has to make sure that the documentation is getting done, that quality control is taking place and that he, he or she facilitates the uh, uh, the team. And of course, there's that pesky stakeholder. You know, we have to make sure that they're happy and or that we're aggravating them when we have to give them bad news about giving them a system they don't like. Um, so uh, documentation expectations. 
There's an optimization report, which is due by the 35% design. And then there's energy conservation analysis, which uh, that's described more thoroughly in UFC 12002. So there's supposed to be separable reports so you can pull the optimization report and LCCA out from the ECA. But, but the, the optimization report and LCCA is to be done by 35% whereas the ECA is uh, toward design complete. And uh, some lessons uh, that have been learned through SDD validations. Um, if, you, if you deviate from the requirements, provide justifications why. Um, you need to provide explanations of why alternatives and design strategies were chosen and why <clears throat> some were not or why some were considered but not used why that was um we've they have found that folks are complying with installation preferences over uh public law and army policies um the narratives must be easy to navigate which indicates that they weren't um, and that there are times that AE contracts have been found without any criteria or code requirements in either the task order or base contract and sometimes references an outdated local design guide. So uh, yeah, I, having gone through a SDD validation, um, the watchword is document explain why keep a paper trail um, because um, you know they want to see it all in one report they don't want to see it in they don't want to have that like look at your 35 percent design analysis your 65 and 95 to figure out how you got from a to b they want to be able to just look at it in one report so with that i will hand it over to brandon hey thanks dan i'm gonna um we're going to switch screens so I can um, take control of the presentation. All right, can you guys see my screen now? We've got it. Thank you. Okay, great. And now the control. Hold on. There we go. So uh, before we leave this page, I want to reiterate something. So while I would love for the main messages you take away being awareness of the energy optimization processes and how to fit them into your project and that there's an ER, uh, en engineering regulation. Um, I would like to reinforce this this idea about the AE contracts missing requirements. Uh, and this this came up um, where when we were, headquarters was reviewing ahead of uh, an SDD validation and we were looking at um, projects, uh, specific projects. And when we looked at their AE task orders, we noticed uh, in some cases, the task orders, uh, not even just about sustainability, about anything, they had no reference to any UFCs, uh, any kind of codes or standards. Uh, it was just uh, design as a, a building with X scope. And that was it. And then when we looked at the base contract, same thing. It was all silent on Criterion code, so that there were no enforce. There was no way to enforce um, having an AE comply with UFCs, IBC, NFPA, or any of that. Um, all all that district had to lean on would have been uh, the relationship they had with that AE. So that's that's not good. So I would encourage you guys, if any of you are in the position to do so, go check your local um, template task orders in your base contracts and make sure that there's some kind of criteria. Uh, highlighted in those for the AEs to follow. So a little bit uh, out of scope for this presentation, but very important. Okay, so going forward, we'll talk about schedule and how to integrate the, the process into the schedule. And we'll talk about the process itself at a very high level. We're not gonna go through this flow chart, like Dan said, but um, we'll talk about the process of, of uh, uh, fitting this into a, a general, and we're gonna talk about Army specifically. So. This could be a little different for other services. Army Reserve's a little different. Um, Civil Works and others uh, could be quite a bit different as far as how the schedules work. And the other thing you're gonna see here is that the schedules for FY28 uh, and forward look a lot different than they did in the past, even for Army. And so um, we, we toyed with the idea of, of kind of showing you both uh, just so you could see how tough it was and how hopefully it'll be a little easier going forward. But due to 
we just kind of uh, went with FY28 and we'll go forward for there. But expectations, again, talking from the Army, Milcon, uh, we need to incorporate this energy optimization into the Code 2 process that should be in the uh, instructions you get with Code 2, um, the PDR instructions and 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 um, the, the wizard that's in Mercy should have instructions about this also. The idea is to optimize, have the optimization done and have our estimates for any costs that are associated with that before budget lock. And I'll show you what, what that looks like in a moment. Um, this takes this kind of work on a typical Milcon. And by typical, I might mean 15 to $30 million Milcon. Obviously, if it's a 75 to 100 million dollar mill con it could be more if it's if it's like a five million dollar uh, or sorry ten million dollar and it's a small building it might be a little less but generally six to eight weeks of concentrated effort that's for highly experienced personnel if they're doing it right um, if you give them less time than they uh, than it should take to do it right they're going to find ways to cut corners and it's it's not going to be good uh, the scheduled time will actually be longer, so that was concentrated effort. There's a design process, right? It's not somebody's just cranking this out eight weeks um, at their computer, boom, done. There's a lot of uh, – there's kickoff meetings, design charrettes, other stakeholder meetings. There's interaction between multiple uh, discipline team members and all that that all contribute to a, a longer design process. So um, it's, it's more like – uh 12 to um 16 weeks probably for a design process and it could be longer just depends on how you how you work this used to be very difficult due to the um project initiation lag and, and a compressed schedule so for fy27 and earlier this would have been a lot harder um here's fy28 this should be going forward this should be steady state that could change of course in an instant um, but this is this is the way it's supposed to look right now. This is actually we just took um, the graphic that um, the programs folk kick out for the uh, FY28, and we overlaid some of this on that. So you can see here. Uh, let's see. In this work budget lock. Here's budget lock. Given the the lock sy symbol there. Okay, clear enough. That's a final budget lock. Okay, that's the last chance um, to get money set for a project if you need more than what was in the original 1391. Um, there's a little bit of decision space here, obviously, um, that uh, headquarters of the uh, Army have to go through in order to decide whether to uh, move money around in the program to fund certain projects. Maybe they kill other projects uh, to make some of that happen. Um, before that, they get the 35% design. Of course, there's the um, reviews, corrections. There's a lot of stuff that goes on after the 35% design before we get to this point. So the goal here is uh, the, the reason they want to get this code to in here, this 35% design in here before this budget lock is so obviously they have really good numbers going into this. So they know, have very high confidence when they come out of budget lock that the projects will uh, be constructible within the uh, project amounts. Uh, in the past, they wouldn't have done that. In the past, they would have just stopped at a 15% design or even less um, prior to budget lock. So that's good. And what they want, want to do is uh, have the energy um, strategies, the lead strategies, everything that affects the design and construction costs um, figured before they get to that. So that's why we incorporate this into the 35%. So in the past, uh, well, I'll show you this. Here's the PDR. This is 15% design. Um, Generally, for a PDR project definition re, uh, report, uh, we're not doing a class on Milcon process. So hopefully, you guys are following some of this. If not, I'm happy to talk about it offline. But um, so we have a 15% due here. There's also a cost estimate that goes with this um, PDR. So there's a, a, a an even earlier. So there's an estimate that comes with 35%, and then one at 15% with PDRs back here. Also, this this 15% design and the and the uh, estimate that comes with it is used for a rack and stack. So headquarters DA is still in this, um, you don't see it here, but in here they're doing a rack and stack of projects based on the anticipated costs, uh, based on the costs that are out of the PDR. So there's there's like a two budget lock. They, they come out of this, do a rack and stack of here's how the projects fall out based on what we know so far. Then they do it again during this decision space before they lock everything out finally. Uh, before you get to here, they, they give you a code two. Code two means go to 35% design. Uh, if it was a code three, it would have been just do a PDR. Um, and then back here, they do a code one, which means you could do an AE selection. 
And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, during code one, if you're doing an in-house design, you could actually go ahead and get started with doing design charrettes. Um, you got to be careful about how far you progress, but you can do some work at code one. So in the past, this 15% or I'm sorry, the 15% or PDR due is about when the 35% would have been due. So you can see um, they would have issued a code to, they probably would have issued it back here in July, August, September, somewhere in here, towards the end of summer. Uh, the team would have got going. Uh, usually they would need a 35% by like some, like uh, before QC and all that, probably by sometime in January, they'd go through the Q, internal QC and then they'd probably be issuing it by March or April. So that's when 35% was due. So now you can see they've extended this schedule quite a bit. Just means they're giving us the codes way earlier for um, the program. Um, so we have the same amount of time that we used to have for 35% for 15% for PDR. And that's the best time to go ahead and have the optimization complete uh, so that you can move, have have good decisions, good costs ready for, for Army to make decisions about whether to fund some of the things we need and uh, move forward from there. We'll talk about the process. We don't need to go through that piece right now. So the process, we get a code two design directive, or if it's in-house, you might get a code one uh, and be able to start some of this, establish the design team, identify stakeholders, get the kickoff meeting going. So sometimes you may not have, you'll notice I have a design charrette and kickoff meeting. You may not have two different meetings. You might just have one meeting and, and for different services and different like SRM or other, um work you may just have one squashed you know it might just be one meeting all squashed together which is fine you just just have to figure out how to work all this in when they've been squashed before i've had to um do a lot at this kickoff or design charrette and then later have a, a conference call maybe if necessary uh you'll have a kickoff meeting uh, before you get to the kickoff meeting you want to gather data as much as you can so you understand the site so you understand the climate, uh, the codes that are going to be applied. Uh, what are the energy goals? Do we know anything about the facilities? Um, do we know anything about the site? Do we know what anything about utilities? Anything you can gather uh, before the kickoff is great. You would also develop the questions you're going to have at the kickoff. At the kickoff, you'll talk to the stakeholders. You'll um, want to validate the codes and energy goals of the project. Um, anything you couldn't grab ahead of time, you're going to grab there. So the site facility data, you're going to want to understand how the facilities use what kind of occupancy there's going to be, uh, you know, what are their requirements for th uh, thermal conditions, lighting, and all that. Uh, and then what kind of constraints and preferences do the customers have? And I'll always say preferences. I don't say requirements just because you just want to be careful about conflicting um, laws, UFC, or um, higher level policies with installation, uh, quote unquote, requirements. Those are really all, often just preferences. So before you get to the, you'll do some homework. That homework may include, you know, doing, uh, coming up with options for orientation and massing or for site layouts that uh, you could consider for uh, energy and sustainability. And yeah, I know a lot of times this is locked in by the time we get it and there's not much you can do. But within the constraints you have available and some buildings and sites, we do have that, sorry. Um, you want to consider that. You want to look at alternative floor plans, assess potential for natural ventilation and daylight. You know, are we in a climate where natural ventilation makes sense? Um, can is the building suitable, and can we get it configured so that we get a whole lot of daylighting? Are there other de passive design features we can consider based on the climate and the usage of the facility? So going into the design charrette, we have a good idea about those things and what we can do. What's our potential for renewable energy store? We can have those discussions. Um, and then what kinds of systems or features um, might we consider for, for the building uh, so we can have those uh, discussions during the design charrette with the stakeholder. And then during the charrette, you'd want to narrow those options down for orientation and massing. You might even select one, uh, select your floor plans, uh, validate you know any kind of features or, or systems. Um, make sure they're okay before you go into a full-blown analysis of them. Um, if there's problems with any systems that you've or features that you've uh, suggested you want to know that um, the, the stakeholders have a problem with that and why, um, and there may be some back and forth on that. It may not, you may not just accept uh, we don't like X, so don't do it. Probably needs to be a little more discussion on that. Um, so coming out of the design charrette, you should have some idea of what you're going to actually analyze during the uh, optimization process. 
Um, and uh, I would suggest that you have Smee's review um, those. Actually, I think in the EO upcoming year, that's going to be fired in, in a recent ECB that was uh, suggested as a, uh, a recommendation. Uh, but before you do all this analysis, which is a lot of time and effort, somebody that knows what they're doing should check and make sure you've got sufficiently varied alternatives, that they're all code compliant, that they're feasible and all that so that um, – you have a good you have a good analysis going forward. What you don't want to have is you've submitted an optimization report after the stakeholder meeting and, and you guys decided what to do and you and you went forward and you did some design and you have an optimization report. Then they get a review. Then you find out, oops, uh, we picked some uh, strategies we probably shouldn't have. Um, and you got to go back to this side and do some of this again. So get that review um, early. Make sure everything looks okay. So during this analysis is when you're doing the energy modeling and life cycle costs that uh, Dan talked about. Um, coming out of that, you would also look at your third party certification system, see what kind of points you can get for lead. That's all kind of happening in here. Sometimes sometimes that may um, overtake your uh, trying to comply with federal requirements. So federal requirements for energy, for example, you know, it's based on life cycle cost. It may not be that stringent, but for lead, maybe you need 10 lead points in energy and uh, atmosphere, and maybe that's what drives your requirement here. And so you're going beyond um, just the federal requirement. So that has to be part of the consideration. You might have to iterate. Um, you know, these are interactive systems, so you may have to iterate as you go. And uh, when you come out on the other side, I would again recommend a SME review to make sure that you did the analyses correctly, because these are going to be the basis for decisions. And so, again, you don't want to have bad math and then go into a stakeholder meeting, have all that decided, and then ultimately later find out you, you messed up. So have that SME review early on. Dan mentioned this uh, or showed this uh, matrix. It's not real clear. Sorry about the, the um, uh, resolution on this. But, you know, th this is where we would show all of our alter alternatives, what we're considering for systems and features, first costs, operation and maintenance costs, energy costs, any other utility costs, uh, the, the life cycle cost uh, over time, uh, all that information, how much energy are we saving, how many lead points are we getting, all that could be rolled up into one matrix or multiple matrices um, showing, hey, these, these are, these are, the results of the analyses, this is how we're going to make our decisions based on this data. And that comes out um, before we have a stakeholder uh, call to talk about how to narrow them down. Um, so we go forward, we have the stakeholder meeting. Uh, we talk about, we decide on what we're going to actually design. Uh, one more recommended SME review, <laughs> make sure you made the right decisions. I've, I've seen projects where the stakeholders uh, steered the project team a certain way, and that wasn't really a legal way to go. Um, but the project team tried to do it because the stakeholders just wanted it. Um, but their data showed that mm, that was illegal. You got to do something different. So, or you got to sharpen your pencil and come up with something else. So, make sure you get some review of like what decisions were made. Um, and so, once you make all those decisions, you move forward with the 35% design and work on the optimization report, which just takes everything you did back here and documents it uh, appropriately. Now, I have these two things separated. This becomes part of the optimization report, but this report itself is not that important for making decisions. And so, it could be a little bit um, segregated from um, the rest of this and lag behind if necessary. And we've had to do that on projects in the past where um, we've had really truncated schedules and this is the important part. So we got to this point and we we met with stakeholders, made decisions, moved forward with design. And this, this oh, sorry, this block about optimization report actually followed after the 35% design uh, itself. Uh, we had to have to do enough to design here at 35% to make sure the cost estimates were good. That was the primary goal. That was that secondary was making sure the drawings looked good and we had a good design analysis. So remember the whole point of this exercise is to get good cost information, scope information so that um, we get the uh, facilities program correctly. So that's always your number one priority with all this. Uh, the optimization reports, the full narrative with descriptions of the process, alternative descriptions, explanations, input and output reports, and so forth. And Dan had mentioned that already. 
So once they've decided that they're going to move forward with a project with a locked scope and budget, they will issue a code six, which means go to uh, final design and you'll move forward with interim and final design. And then once that's complete, we'll do compliance energy modeling, which means we, we try to figure out what's the percent energy uh, reduction we achieved, uh, how many lead points did we actually achieve, um, and those those kinds of things. Um, this type of modeling is a little different from the optimization modeling. They're, they're for different purposes, so they're a little bit different. Um, there can be a little optimization happening here. We generally don't want you to have to go back and, and redo major system lifecycle cost analyses. This, you might do detailed cost analyses. This might be a, a phase where you're looking at, do I have three boilers or four boilers? or three or four boilers, or do I need, you know, those kinds of things, just just more detailed level stuff. Uh, but otherwise you don't go back to the beginning unless you have a big change in the project, like a, uh, something that's like 30% of the PA or, you know, thir or the change would it make a 30% impact to your energy use, then then you may go, you would go back and uh, redo the optimization. Otherwise just keep moving forward. So. Some schedule tips. Um, once you get code two, now this this is probably more important when you have really short schedules uh, for other services or in the past for Army, but but going forward for Army should be okay. But you may still run into this problem with other services. But initiate work immediately after co receipt of code two. We've had projects where we found out that um, the program or project management had sat on a code um, before engaging uh, with a project team. And, and maybe it was a month or two before that team got going. I've seen it on the other side too, where the engineering couldn't resource anybody immediately for a project. So it kind of lagged for a couple of months. And so that can impact a schedule, especially if a very short schedule. So, um, you know, the only way around that is to get started early, make sure you gather information quickly, find past project information, uh, whether that's in-house or AE, so there could be AE projects that uh, were in the same site that maybe, whether they were similar or not, that could have good information in them. They could have uh, some of this optimization from their past projects that you could use or look at or get some ideas from, uh, or in-house projects that did the same. Kick off with the stakeholders as early as possible. I like the idea of sending them a questionnaire if you can't get to them right away. So if you can't have a meeting right away, sometimes because you can't get these people on the same room at the same time, uh, send a questionnaire ahead of time. And a lot of times they won't answer those questions. Uh, in the questionnaire itself, um, but but they may, and I've had them respond with some of these answered before. And it, it and even if it doesn't, by the time you get to the kickoff, they at least know what kind of questions you're going to ask, and they know who to have at the meeting, and they know, uh, and they may come with answers or have the right people there for answers. And if you don't get all that at the end of the meeting, you just keep going and try to get answers to those questions as you go forward. Uh, need the PM to reinforce the need for quick information stakeholders. I've seen projects, I've been part of projects where we had this, um, the stakeholders were scared to have anybody communicate outside a certain chain of communication. They wanted to go through their own uh, project manager on their side to our project manager, then to us, and then back through that. And that really slowed things down and made it difficult to uh, execute quickly. And all we could do is let the PM know that was a problem and the chiefs and leadership know that that was a problem and then let them decide how to handle that. And then, you know, we did the best we could with that. And and it caused problems and I was okay with that, frankly. I mean, once you've told everybody there's an issue and, and this is how to fix it, it's, you know, and they don't, then you've done all you can. All right. Uh, definitely leverage past similar analyses for decision making. It's it, per the ER. Um, you can use historic and, and the ECB that just came out. You can do um, use historic analyses to some extent. Now you got to use them. Use uh, apply good judgment, right? Because these could be if it's a 15 year old study, um, it's using old technology. That's probably not appropriate. You probably want to use something within the last one or two years that was executed. And if you feel like there could be a, a uh, enough of a change in the market uh, or costs or things to uh, um, make a, a difference in the output, then you'd want to update those. Um, and if the schedule's compressed, you may have to get creative about how to work the process in, uh, which which we've done in the past. Um, but if you ever get in that pinch, uh, I'm happy to help talk you through it to some extent. And and then you're you know, no matter what you do, there's a critical path still. Um, so if you never get enough time to begin with. Um, corners may have to get cut, um, and it's best to document that uh, that's the case. So, 
And then uh, just uh, that's that's the process. But then I wanted to uh, leave us with this is something that commonly gets missed. It's design build projects. The energy optimizations required during the RFP development or pre-award phase. It's not to be um, this is for fixed uh, price contracts. If you have a, a different kind of contract that could be different, but for a fixed price design build contract, uh, we don't delegate the life cycle cost to the um, design build contractor. This needs to be done in advance. Uh, based on that analysis, we'll put prescriptive system requirements in the RFP. Uh, for envelope, it could be stuff like U values or or a certain um, you know density of material or what have you. It doesn't have to be. Here's the wall system you will use. You could do some performance there. But for HVAC systems, we would generally say here's the uh, exact type of HVAC system you'll use. We may not dictate minor details. We're not designing the system, but we'll tell them what kind of system to use. Um, and then. If there's any, uh, there should be language in the RFP that says that any betterments that come from the bidders have to include a life cycle cost to justify the deviation. And then realize during source selection that can make things complicated, and you're going to have to have someone review those life cycle cost analyses uh, to make sure that any of those uh, betterments are uh, accepting any of those is warranted. Uh, because what you could be doing is, oh yeah, that's nice. They're going to give us this for this, you know, and they're going to give it to us for uh, free. And uh, that's that's awesome. But you may not realize there's an operation and maintenance tail to it. That could be a problem. So big deal, and it's commonly missed. Um, with that, we're ready to answer any questions. Okay, got a couple in the chat. Um, how does value engineering process impact life cycle cost analysis decisions? Good question. Um, so I've never seen it integrated well <laughs> with VE, but it could be. There's an opportunity there. I used to work with VEOs at my old district on this and try to get, but we normally end up uh, overwhelmed with other matters. But uh, yeah, so there's a couple of thoughts that come to mind. One thing we could do is, you know, have VE done early. I never liked the having the VE done at 65% design. I know why we do it, um, but I liked having VE done early in the project so that it um, influences the project going forward rather than looking back and where could we save money. Um, so, you know, what kind of we had thought about was um, if we had to have a workshop, um, have the workshop early. Workshop includes identifying uh, strategies and alternatives to consider that would be included in the optimization and the life cycle cost analysis. Um, then go offline for a while. We do our homework, right? Our optimiz we would do our optimization. We would do the life cycle cost analyses. And then come back and we would reassess those. And that would become part of the VE process itself. Uh, and that's exactly what VE does, right? During the workshop, they identify opportunities. Um, they assess them through the week. Uh, they provide some kind of... Uh, sort of uh, abbreviated economic study and give you some some thoughts about what it would cost and what it would save, and, and that's it. But I think um, it's the same process. This is the same as that process, and we would just um, extend the VE sort of process to include all that. The other thing we could do is if you have a VEO, I'm sorry, not VEO, an AE doing VE support, uh, perhaps they're providing a team. You might even be able to build into their scope that they perform the life cycle cost analyses for you. Uh, to, and if that's helpful, it may be a problem from a, a logistics standpoint and from a, how do you work it into your process standpoint. But that's just another thought, especially if you're in a district maybe that has not a whole lot of um, extra depth in your um, engineering departments, and that extra help could 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 uh, um, well. That could be extra help. The other thing is uh, we've even talked about using AEs to do some of this anyway, uh, where a district may have struggle with executing this. And so that, you know, that would be a way to in integrate that with the VE, um, the VE team. So now here's what I don't like. I don't like 65% VE. You've done all this study. You decided what to do. Now somebody wants to change what you've just spent uh, months uh, doing all these studies to uh, decide to do. Um, so the answer for me, whenever I see, uh, uh, hey, here's a here's a, a suggestion, is almost an absolute no because we just studied the heck out of this and and we're done. <laughs> all right. I uh, I have uh, one thing to add for that. Um, I did have a situation where um, 
the customer had a preference as to uh, what kind of systems they wanted. When I did my LCCA and I got my information from RS Means and CBRE Cost Lab and built the stuff, and it came out with a system that they really didn't want. It caused a whole lot of angst between us, uh, the installation and our design team. The VE team, by the time they came on board, which was after 35%, they had the cost estimate from cost engineering. Whereas I was building my LCCA on my own because we don't get cost support. Um, and uh, they're, they said, hey, you know, you might, this system that they want is probably going to be more life cycle cost effective. So now, since they pointed that out, it's like, okay, I was able to get the cost data from uh, the cost engineer after he finally did it and strip out the uh, the contingencies that they slap in there for 35%. And lo and behold, it just made it so that our customer didn't hate us uh, too much, uh, more than they usually would. No, uh, so it, it, uh, it was helpful in that regard. Now, um, Thankfully, it was a SRM O&M job, so it wasn't like uh, we're, we're already too late for it. But um, so, yeah, over. So a little more follow on about VE, um, mostly commiserate, commiseration that um, we want to do the VE around 35 percent and not at 15 percent as some PMs want to push for because there's not enough to really evaluate for VE. <laughs> Um, and then there's a, another question. Do you recommend including an EUI in your design build RFPs? So the energy use intensity. So um, you can if you have a specific energy goal that would support that. So EUI is nothing but, I mean, it's just a target energy use for the building, right? Um, we, If you'd rather use that than a percent energy reduction i guess that's possible they still by law have to do the best well they have to at least report the percent energy reduction you could use an ei it just depends on your goals and th and this is goes back to the i'm kind of dancing around it because the er again we're trying to make it policy agnostic so whether using an eui can help you or not depends on your policies an eui does not help you with meeting the federal requirement necessarily um if you have a specific goal of, um, uh, well, if you've given an EUI target in a policy, that would be a way to do it is, hey, you got to hit this EUI target. I've also seen, say, in a design build RFP where we did the analyses, the life cycle cost analyses and all that. We determined the best uh, energy performance that was life cycle cost effective. Say it came out at 16%. We would say, hey, you need to achieve at least a 16% energy reduction. We've already determined that's the best second cost effective. It had that all backed up. Uh, we kind of left it up to them how they got there. Um, I don't like that. And it's not good for fixed price contracts for various reasons, which I won't get into. That could be a whole class itself. But uh, you could do that. And you could do the same with an EUI. You could just convert that to an EUI for that type of facility and then make that the target. So, But real quick before Ed um, uh, jumps in, I, I would uh, caution you that EUI, you don't know what the EUI is going to be until someone actually moved into the building because everything we're doing is a simulated model using assumed schedules and usage and things like that. So you might design for something like uh, even even ASHRAE in their uh, one of the training courses I took from them said, you know, and it, I think it's written in the 2016, 2019 that it's like this is just a tool it don't expect your building to do this once you get it done it's just a decision making tool so the EUIs used to be part I don't know if it's still on but the 2017 army SDD policy had the EUI tables but again they're based on commercial construction not on military construction so like anyway over yeah and and you hit you were hitting on that point is that it is in the 2017 SDD policy. There is a chart on EUI. What I would say is, though, I think that energy optimization takes precedent over an EUI because almost all policies say 
if life cycle cost effective meet this EUI. We don't right, have an overarching policy that says no matter what meet this EUI. So if you go into 10 CFR 433 and the ASHRAE energy reduction what and what we have to meet, I think Brandon hit on it and then Dan came back with, with the SDD policy. Energy optimization in LCCA is pretty much going to give us the answer. Whereas if you say meet this EUI if life cycle cost analysis pans out, then you're really just doing a life cycle cost analysis. Did I say that right, Brandon? <laughs> Did it use? Uh, this is why we need a whole class. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so you go, yeah, say it for now. Between energy optimization and ASHRAE 90.1 2019 and um, yeah, <laughs> I was close. All right, I guess we'll leave it there. We don't have any other questions well, or comments, so I, thank you. I got a, I do got oh, a question. Oh, Brandon's got some. Come well, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Dan uh, brought up, and both of you talked about it, the uh, 2017 SDD policy. Is that still effective, or did the res Army Resilient Policy, uh, Resilient Building Policy, was that meant to supersede that, basically rescind the old policy and supersede that, or is it meant to be no. just another layer of stuff? It's another layer. It clearly does not say this supersedes or retracts the Army STD policy of 2017. Bummer. All right. Really? There, there can be conflicts, and, and the ECB is forthcoming, but we're not there yet, and I still have to work through some of the issues with that. And we'll talk, Brandon, but yeah, there's, there, there's some things that we've got to look at. All right. I'll, I'll admit to everybody, I don't mind, but... Um, after a couple of rounds of looking at the EUIs and that old policy, we started ignoring them because they're, um, Dan hinted at that too, that they're absolutely ridiculous. So we, we, we couldn't hit them. I mean, we did the best we could and couldn't hit them. And, and it was kind of tied back to the life cycle stu cost stuff that Ed, Ed mentioned, but all right, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, it, but it may be a goal. So that being said, there are pilot projects that are going to net zero that are have that are having EUI targets, and EUI is not out of the question. Even recently, it was discussed, and I had a question is, what EUIs are we meeting? So um, I, I would still say it's good to have in a design analysis what EUI you are meeting, um, because that, that, that informs us of how well we're doing in our life cycle cost analysis. Wasn't yeah, uh, and, and, ASA supposed to be developing uh, EUI specific to mil military facilities so that we have more realistic targets? Again, like my the one SDD exp uh, validation experience I had, where I, granted it was a it was the design model, not real life. So the buildings occupied now, we should go back and see how it was doing, how it's doing in terms of EUI, but the. Uh, just out of the uh, trace model, uh, it was like sick, like uh, significantly more than what the uh, Army STD policy uh, called for, which is out of I think ASHRAE 100 or something like that. And you know, so in my validation report, I'm like, well, I doubt ASHRAE was thinking of a, you know, a hangar that's used as a training space that gets air conditioned when it was thinking classroom, you know? So it's just, you know, it's like, it's a load. I'm oh, sorry, it, it's a, uh, it, 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 use your judgment. <laughs> yeah, so you asked the question and it's not that the ASA is developing it. I believe that there's studies and research being done at URDIC for some of this, some of these EUI targets and EUI discussions and, and all of that. So yes, there is something going on in the background. We don't have policy yet. Um, and I'm supposed to be asking you questions, not the other way around. But <laughs> but what I would say is things may change, but what you've presented here is what we're doing today. What we may be doing because of the Army policy on resilient things and just UFCs, because of all of these things, I do believe there will be change in the future in the next two years because of what we're learning through our pilot projects and what the what the policies are doing, trying to meet Executive Order 14057.
But I'm hey, glad that, 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 the, that this webinar kind of was a really good summary of our processes and what we have. Hey, can I can I continue the ambush? I know it's a little past time. Um, <laughs> it's past time, and we can cut this out of the recording. But I'll continue answering. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. Stephanie, stop recording. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> hey, so 